Hello, this is Tom from anti-proton.com, and this is the Polymaster 1703 MO1B. There's an A version too. This one is the B version, which uses Bluetooth to communicate with things like this PDA or a computer. The A version uses USB. This is a spectrometer, a gamma spectrometer, an isotope detector, a scintillation counter, and a dosimeter all in one. It does all of this. That's the mode button, switching between its functions. Below it is the light button. If you hit the light button, it cuts the light on. If you hold it down, it'll tell you how much battery power you have left, which is useful. Currently, it's in search mode. When an isotope is near it, as you can see, the readings go up. And they move around pretty rapidly. You can also switch to the background radiation mode. Again, this is in microsieverts power, just like before. And hitting the button one more time, we can actually see that we have absorbed 2.26 microsieverts since this was last reset. We can even cut the unit off if we wished. This unit is capable of isotope detection and works off of a simple AA battery. It actually gets 1,000 hours of battery life with that battery, 60 hours if it's connected to a PDA. Using Bluetooth and this PDA, I can actually wander around and take gamma spectroscopic uh, readings. Or this little tiny chicken nugget device here, which connects to the computer. The little tiny device was about 12 bucks. The PDA is 50, maybe $100, depending on what, what, which one you buy. They can be as much as 400 if you buy a nice one, but a little $100 one will work great and connect to this as long as it has Bluetooth. Now we're going to hit the mode button until we see the word off, and then we're going to hit the light button to cut the unit on to Bluetooth. Now we can connect to computers, PDAs, whatever supports Bluetooth. All right, let's cut on the, the uh, PDA and start the Polymaster PolyIdentify software. The software is now looking for units, and it'll hunt down whatever unit it can find, which obviously should be this unit that's close to you. We're now in counts per second. This unit is behaving as a uh, scintillation counter. Notice the little 5% there means that we're 95% accurate. Now, if we get all of a sudden a sudden little burst of high-energy photons, the reading will shoot up. The accuracy will go down. There we go. As the reading goes up, as readings will do so on both Geiger counters and scintillation counters, the accuracy goes down, and this shows you very, very easily. It's actually quite nice. This is actually detecting all the gammas in the area, and it's giving you a real, actual dose rate. Of course, you're seeing counts per second right now, but in dose rate, you're actually seeing the real dose per energy, not calibrated against cesium-137. Now we're going to start a calibration to, for temperature, for background counts, and so on. And you, sh you see it says calibration on the unit. Coming back about uh, 30 seconds to a minute later when it's done, this is a Micron plastic scintillation crystal. That's not what's in this device. This device has a cesium iodide thallium doped crystal, but it's to give you an idea. They're kind of similar things. You notice when radiation is exposed to the crystal, it scintillates. I'm simulating this with a black light. Obviously, you wouldn't be able to see this with the naked eye, well, not with very low levels of radiation. But see how the crystal relax, reacts to the black light. The cesium iodide thallium built crystal inside of this little pager does the same sort of thing when energy from uh, gamma rays hits it. it. It emits light with an intensity proportionate to the energy that struck it. Now we can change to a pictorial view, if you like, in the back. Hit the button here. Now as radiation is exposed to the unit, we can actually sort of see in a, in an auto-scaling mode what that looks like. Here is a uh, World War I military radium compass. And as you can see, the gamma rays start flowing. And we move away, they lower. We push the unit back, and they will rise again.
but of course this is auto scaling so you have to give it a few seconds to kind of catch up let's get close in there there we go now we're auto scaling and you can see very nice I personally prefer seeing the numbers but you can do this either way by the way the red is signifying an alarm which is important we'll switch back you can actually see the counts per second from the actual compass look at that 81 counts per second not bad not bad at all and we are now 96 percent accurate now if we put the compass on top we don't have to put it on top it could be several feet away and this could pick it up but putting it on top it'll do it a lot faster let's find out why it's radioactive we already know it's radium 226 but let's let's confirm that and pretend you didn't know maybe you just found this in your uh, grandpa's desk and you wanted to find out we can switch to gamma measurement mode first this is before we do an isotope identification and you can actually see uh, a much more detailed layout showing you the uh, microsieverts per hour this is picking up and by the way that five five and a half microsieverts per hour is what you get from holding this thing that's not so good personally I'd prefer not to put that in my pocket which is I'm sure where the service people put it they didn't know any better of course this unit actually gets more radioactive over time due to the decay of its uh, of radium-226 into its various uh, daughters interesting well, now that we know how hot it is, let's confirm what's in it. We could take a gamma spectrum, but we could have a lot more fun by just quickly clicking the rapid identification feature. Now this is warning us that our counts are a little, little high. It likes a little bit lower count rate, but it's perfectly capable of working on very high count rates, many times higher than this. Okay, let's see what we get. This shouldn't take long with this much radiation. And this is actually trying to ID the isotope that's offending us right this moment. What could it be? Give it another second. There we go. Radium-226, right on the dot. And it's, uh, it identifies it as norm, which is naturally occurring radioactive material. It is a natural occurring uh, 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 isotope. Now of course in this case it's in an unnatural format but it is technically spe technically speaking with something that comes out of the ground. Let's do an actual gamma uh, uh, spectrum of it. Now you have to give the gamma spectrum a few seconds. This is going to do a wide spectrum from around 30 to 40 kilo electron volts all the way up to about 3,500 kilo electron volts. There we go. Very 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 quick look at it go we can zoom in and you can see the peaks as they slowly start to rise and form now if you sit this down for about 20 or 30 minutes you'll get a really really good spectrum right off the bat if you look to the uh, far left sorry far right of the actual spectrum you can actually see the um, I'm pointing to the left but to the right you'll see right there is bismuth uh, 214 and that's one of the dead giveaways that also tells you how old it is and that we look at the peak information you see it's almost dead on for uh, uh, 609 kilo electron volts close it's not quite on there it's getting there it'll it'll get closer and more accurate as time goes on and there's the lead 214 peaks the x-axis in the bottom is energy from left to right going from low to high energy and the y-axis going up and down to the number of counts in each channel we can zoom in there's 512 channels by the way if you're curious and this allows us to take a reasonably good analysis of uh, lower energy photons. This does go all the way up to 3.5 MeV, but of course, obviously, being a thin crystal device like this is, it's really more suited for the lower energy. Although, interestingly enough, it does not go below around 40 kilo electron volts, and I find that very curious. But it's an interesting limitation in the unit. Now, we've switched to logarithmic view, by the way, too. If you notice, everything becomes all kind of bloated out of proportion. Logarithmic view is very useful in some cases. I am a linear view fan. There we go back to linear. It's scaled linear, by the way. That's, that's my personal opinion of things. We'll do an identify. Now, as you see, 
large amounts of things are identified, but only at the very top do you see things that are identified directly. A lot of the other stuff below that says uncertain or very uncertain, and it picks up all kinds of things like plutonium and stuff which aren't there. And here's a view of it. It's kind of hard to see on the video because of the way the little uh, uh, old-fashioned LCD screen is. All right, let's take something else. This is a this is a Fiesta Ware plate, and this has depleted uranium in it, which is kind of funny. I'll put this on top. It goes bananas, of course. There it goes. People used to eat off of this. That in itself is an interesting statement. Let's see what we find in this depleted uranium. We should find uranium-238 and uranium-235. The ratio should be a little bit lower than normal. Normally, I like around 0.7% uh, uranium-235. But, you know, we'll see what we get. I think it's about 0.3% for this unit. And here we go. Just a few minutes later, we have uranium-235, uranium-238. On the PC version of this, it will actually do a en enrichment analysis. The little handheld one does not do the enrichment analysis. Now, let's say you had two common industrial isotope uh, samples. And you wanted to find out which, which, which one was which and what they were. Well, if you put them together, it's going to tell you what both of them are. It'd be probably better to put them in one at a time and do an analysis to know which one is which. But you know what the heck? Let's let's be a little tougher on the machine. Let's put them both in there and see if it can figure out what they are. I obviously know what they are. But pretend I don't. Pretend they don't have stickers, which I have on the other side. They're just upside down. Let's say that you um, start working at a, a, at a uh, new college or university and you find these old samples sitting in the back of your office and they're, the, the stickers have worn off. Some fool didn't you know, document them correctly because you should always document this stuff and have it all written up. But let's say somebody didn't. What are these? Let's find out. This should only take a minute because these are pretty hot, nice little samples. They're around 37 kilobecquerels each, plus or minus. The orange one's a little bit lower. It's actually more like 33 kilobecquerels, but it's actually higher in energy. Well, I, I know what they are already, so I'm cheating. There they are. Industrial Cobalt-60 and Cesium-137. They're both labeled as industrial because they are. They're typical industrial isotopes. Yay. Amazing. Now let's do a spectrum and see what the spectrum looks like. And if you're familiar with gamma spectroscopy, then you'll, you'll, you'll immediately pick both of these two out. They're sort of obvious dead giveaways, but we'll see. Now we'll give this a few moments. There they start forming. And right off the top, you can see the cesium-137 peak at 662 keV. And if you're not familiar with gamma spectroscopy, you're saying, what are you, what are you talking about? I don't, I don't understand what's obvious about this. Well, just trust me, it's obvious. But I'll, I'll see if I can point these out. But let's give it another moment for the uh, uh, cobalt-60 gammas to start building up in there. They're higher in energy, so they go a lot further. It takes a lot longer for them to show up. Now, there we go, 662 keV. That is cesium-137. That right there is 1,173.24, and that's 1,332.5 keV, and that's a backscatter peak from the cobalt-60. Those are wonderful little check source items. Now we can stop the accumulation. Okay. And go back here and look at them a little bit more, and you can save this, and you can do... Uh, um, you can do all sorts of uh, analysis later on with it. You can you can save these for posterity if you like. You can run isotope identification against them later on. Do all sorts of fun stuff, and we can play around and actually look and see where the backscatter peaks are and the Compton edges and all that sort of stuff. And earlier, by the way, I call it a backscatter peak. It was actually a Compton edge. Now let's take this can of food and let's find out if it's radioactive. You can do a simple gross analysis. Even you could do this with a Geiger counter. Just put the, 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 the Geiger counter, or in this case the Polymaster, which is actually not a Geiger counter. You can put it right on top of it and see if it's radioactive. In, case, in, in, in fact, actually, you notice that little can of food is radioactive. Now, if you get some lead blocks right here from um, uh, someplace, like rotometals.com is a good place to get them for, and I'll put that in the details, you can make a little tiny quick place to do testing. And I suggest using the lead because it makes it a lot easier to test. But if you do, you want to wear gloves when handling lead, which is much, probably more dangerous than the radiation to begin with. And you definitely want to put your food inside of plastic because you don't want lead in your food. That's worse than the radiation. Well, it's radiation. Stick that inside and put some lead blocks over top. And you put the polymaster on top too. And if you do this, you can actually do a really good job of food testing with this thing. It's actually pretty useful. 
stick it on top, just buy a couple of these blocks, stick them together, and you can test the heck out of your food. Look at this. Stick them on top. And the background will go down as a result of this lead. It makes it easier to pick out the nasties. All right. Now we'll start an a, a isotope identification, and we'll go for a walk. Come back 10, 20, 30 minutes later, an hour, depending on how long we are willing to test. And we'll see, why is this can of food radioactive? Do we want to eat radioactive food? Maybe it's like a Brazil nut, and it's naturally occurring radiation. Or, or maybe it's high in potassium, like a bunch of potatoes. Those would also be naturally radioactive. And a Geiger counter will tell you they're radioactive, but not why. The polymaster will tell you that it's just good old potassium-40 or that it's evil, nasty cesium-137. You'll, you'll find the difference but the, uh, that particular way. And that's one of the benefits of having a scintillation or a gamma spectrometer uh, um, over a Geiger counter. Don't get me wrong, though. Geiger counters are still of use. Cesium-137. Did this can of fish come from Fukushima? Look at that. Let's do a, a actual gamma spectrum. If you want to get all hardcore, you can do a gamma spectrum. You can actually look yourself and see what's going on. That's even more useful. Yeah, that's if you're a little bit, little bit more seasoned at doing this, of course. But the is isotope identification feature is pretty nice too. And there, you can see, there it is. You remember from before, the obvious cesium-137 peak? Give it a couple of moments. And I zoomed in on this picture. It's a little bit zoomed in. But you see that peak right there, cesium-137? Obviously, this is fish that's not good to eat. You don't want to eat anything with that much cesium-137 or for that much, for that matter, any. I mean, you're always going to get a little bit out of your fish from the Pacific, a couple of back rolls here and there. But, you know, all right. Look at that peak. Beautiful. Well, not beautiful in your food, though. Let's pull this off and let's take a look at this can of food that's so terrible and radioactive that our polymaster had to be used to, to save us. Thank you, polymaster. <laughs> but anyhow, oh, wait a minute. What's what's that? Ignore the man behind the curtain. That that looks like a that looks like a cesium 137 check source. <laughs> the food's not really radioactive. I was lying to you, but I wanted to show you what it would look like if it were radioactive. That's what it would look like if it were radioactive. Now, we can actually test this for real. And by the way, the point of that was just to show you what it would look like. Obviously, you know, if you got some Miyagi oysters or something from, like, you know, northern Japan, hell, they might actually be radioactive, and you might actually see that for real. And maybe a season 134 peak as well. All right, let's cover that back up. We'll go hide the cesium so it doesn't affect the reading. And here we are, about 10, 15 minutes later. And as you can see, there's almost nothing there. I mean, there's a few little tiny peaks right there. They look like they probably come from uranium or something, which is very normal in your food. You eat about 400 micrograms of uranium a year anyway. Perfectly normal. Look at that. Little tiny peaks. Nothing to worry about. I wouldn't worry about it too much. The most of what you're seeing there is a lead, uh, lead um, uh, x-ray peak anyway. Nothing to worry about. Whatever might be in this, it's very tiny. Not of any major consequence. We can click identify and look. Now you'll see two lists. In the top, you'll see the list of where isotopes found would be, but as you can see, if I highlight them, there's nothing there. And the lower list, the one on the bottom, are isotopes that were not found. Thank you, Polymaster1703M01B. You're my favorite portable handheld gamma spectrometer. Bye bye.